to look this morning just at verses 41 through 44 and to do it under the title The Last Battle Begins The Last (coughs) Battle Begins As I was thinking about how to introduce it I, I thought I'd look up some details on The Last Battle and of course what you immediately find as soon as you look for information on The Last Battle there have been many that have been called The Last Battle just a hundred years ago there was what they called the war to end all wars and of course we know fine well that tragic as it was I saw this morning that 65 million people were involved in it 10 million were killed and 20 million injured it's no wonder they thought it was the last battle the League of Nations and then the United Nations was formed after it if I've got my history right And the whole hope of that was there would never be another war, anything like it. Well, all of us know the awful, awful truth. A great battle did take place 2,000 years on Calvary. It was the major, can I use the word skirmish without demeaning it? It was the major encounter between sin and righteousness and Christ conquered sin that day. It's still being fought out down through the ages and will one day finally be, give way to the appearance of that great king in glory and splendor. So here we have what I've called, as I said, the last battle and where it begins. We know the conclusion from Calvary through history and then one day at the end of the ages C.S. Lewis wrote the book that came to my notice The Last Battle and of course if you're a follower of the Narnia tales you'll know that that is in fact a reflection on the final battle Christ returning when righteousness is established we look to that because of the battle Christ took part in and the war that he won on the cross at Calvary he faced God's wrath on our behalf And I I want to really emphasize in this that it was no easy thing for him. It was truly a traumatic experience. And that he did that because of love for God and love for God's people. I've got three subheadings from the text. First of all, to remind us that our Lord Jesus is a praying man. And that prayer is vital to winning any battle for God. Secondly, that he undertook this war, this battle, as God's servant. And thirdly, while we can read here the account of the external, we know from Scripture that he was also under attack from Satan. And I want to just reflect on those three parts this morning, if God will give me grace. Verse 41, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down, and he prayed. It's an amazing truth, isn't it? The Lord Jesus, the perfect man, the real man, who simultaneously is in complete communication with his Father, communicates deliberately through prayer. Some might have thought there were other things he should have been doing before the Romans came. Some might have argued that time could have been spent better equipping himself for the punishment he was to take. But there is no greater or better equipment for whatever lies ahead than prayer itself. What he needs is that strength which comes from God the Father so that he might face and conquer evil. He needs the present comfort of knowing God in his life and the grace which comes from having the Holy Spirit in him. You cannot miss this great truth if you read the Gospels, that Jesus is a man of prayer. He's a real man. And sometimes we forget this, don't we? He's a real man. He, he felt fear. He felt pain. He felt the, the trauma that was about to come upon him, and he would be overwhelmed by the whole concept of bearing God's wrath. How was he going to do that? By coming to God first for the grace and the strength to do that. Hebrews writes, or the writer of Hebrews writes in 5-7 about Jesus who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death 
and was heard because of his godly fear. That verse in Hebrews 5, 7 is truly well worth pondering upon. That our Savior, with prayers, supplications, but then this vehement, passionate cries, surely what we're looking at in this passage here is one of the clearest instances of those passionate cries, and he was heard. In my study Bible it says, Jesus Christ was also fully man. He was not a deity pretending to be human when he was not. Jesus was fully human. He was born and lived in submission to his earthly parents. He had a fully human body. He grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, says Luke 2.40. He learned the carpentry trade. He experienced hunger, felt thirst and tiredness, faced temptation and eventually suffered even death itself. Jesus Christ was and is fully God and fully man. And as a true man, as the perfect man, he sets before us this pattern and model which cannot be sidestepped. And you'll find it's a pattern all the way through his life. Whenever he came to a major crisis point in life, the first thing he did was seek his father's face in prayer. When he was baptized, he had been praying. When he was going to choose the disciples, he spent the night in prayer beforehand. And you'll find there are many accounts of him being alone in prayer, speaking to his heavenly father. He prayed for Simon because he warned Simon that Satan was coming to take him or to challenge him. He prays here, and lo and behold, what you find that upon the cross, he's praying. I can't emphasize enough, uh, as I read this passage, I can't get away from it, that everything the Lord of glory did for us was, was wrapped, if you want, in this, this cocoon of calling upon God. And here he is, withdrawn from the twelve, a stone's throw. How far can you throw a stone? Not a great distance, really couple of hundred yards. In Matthew and Mark it tells us he took Peter and John with him and they stopped without going the full distance and they are probably the source of our information. But he went away from the twelve and it's about midnight and he doesn't just say a prayer. In Mark's gospel it says he went a little farther and fell on the ground. That's an awesome picture isn't it? In Luke it says he kneeled down. In Mark it says he fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible the hour might pass from him. Matthew says he went a little further and fell on his face. And so you get this picture of him descending to his knees, lying down, face down in the dirt, crying out. Now you might say that's where a humble man goes. But remember that within Judaism the normal position for prayer was standing. The weight of what was upon him brings him to this place of absolutely submitting to God. And although we might never be able to penetrate into the mystery of the horror that was in his mind at this time. cannot help but be stirred about prayer in our own life. The Lord of glory knew exactly what was coming. He had the Old Testament and in the Jewish hymn book there are many indications of what would be suffered on Calvary. Psalm 22 verse 1 will be very familiar to you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me? And from the words of my groaning. You know where those words were next uttered. They were upon the cross as the Saviour was strung up between heaven and earth. That would indicate to you and to me that he's not only praying. He's using the scripture as the basis for his prayer. He would have read the rest of Psalm 22. Verse 7 says, All those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip. They shake their heads. Remember from the Gospels that the Pharisees and others mocked, saying, He says he's the Son of God. And they even think at one minute 
that he's calling on God and they ask for everything to stop so they can see him coming down. They scoffed and mocked and laughed. Psalm 22, 14, I am poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a pot share, and my tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. That's an awesome picture, and it's generally agreed that that's a description of what the human body suffers during crucifixion. There were no surprises for the Savior. The man who had the Old Testament and had the presence of God's Spirit would know these words inside out. Read Psalm 69. It also gives an awful description of crucifixion. He would have read Isaiah 53 as well, but it would say in verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. I want to just bring this to your attention and ask you how would you deal with such a traumatic event how would you deal if you knew that some horrible event was coming tomorrow the saviour sets the pattern he instructs us by his actions he's ready to be obedient to his father he knows that in his the human body there isn't the strength to do that so he gets right down to that point where he casts himself upon God's mercy and in such a way it, there really is a challenge for the whole of our prayer lives in this prayer can be just a matter of saying a few words can't it it's time to pray therefore I must speak but surely as we come to pray we need to be instructed by God's word we need to be helped by God's word to realize that you and I just cannot cope with life on our own. There's a very well-known quote from Martin Luther. He said he had so much to do, he could not get through it without spending at least three or four hours on his knees before God each morning. Yes, three or four hours Bill Hybels has a, a book, doesn't he? I have it in my library. Too busy not to pray. Too busy not to pray. Oswald Chambers writes, Remember, no one has time to pray. We have to take time from other things that are valuable in order to understand how necessary prayer is. Prayer is the Christian's vital breath, the Christian's native air. It's an indication that we have a relationship with a God in heaven who cares for us and who alone can bring us through triumphantly the challenges that are before us. And here the man Jesus Christ prostrates himself in the dust because he loved you and he loved me. Will you and I not be moved to prostrate ourselves before God for those that we love? To knock on heaven's door to give him no peace, as Isaiah says. To give him no rest, I think it's Isaiah 62, isn't it? Until he rebuilds Jerusalem. Oh, dear friends, my Savior, your Savior challenges you. But if you're not an, a believer, I have to tell you, your prayers are not heard. There's one prayer that you need to pray so that your prayers can be heard. Because Jesus in dying here made provision for men from all tribes, tongues and nations to come on the condition that they repent, believe and then confess to God their trust in Christ as Saviour. From then on in you're never alone. You have the Lord of glory right beside you. Jesus is a praying man. He's a praying man because he is God's servant. He's set about serving God in redeeming the people of God. And he knows that. Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You see, it's an interesting scenario. and It struck me that I needed to just add it to my notes. Adam and Eve fell in a perfect garden, didn't they? 
Everything around them was what a person would need to live. They just had that call of God to obedience. And they failed in a world of perfection. The Lord Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. Everything in front of him is tragic. His treasurer is betraying him just at this very minute. If ever a man had occasion not to serve, not to be obedient, it was him. But what does he do? You and I know the outcome because we're here today. He embraces obedience to his father. Not my will be done, but yours. He embraces that for the salvation of his people consciously, voluntarily. This is the point at which all that he had said about the cross is becoming a reality. Within 12 hours he'll be strung between heaven and earth and in, in complete darkness. And he knows the details. He's talked about it often enough. He's not afraid of the cross. But he is at this point, I believe, afraid of, of, of all that will happen to him prior to being on that cross. He's been living that life of perfect obedience. He's been telling his disciples about it and calling them to that same standard because he's here as God's servant. John 6, 38, For I have not come down from heaven, sorry, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. That was his life's work. To do what God in eternity had planned for the redemption of his people. What history had proved was necessary because every other human being had failed. Here he is, the perfect man. But it was no escape, it was no easy task. Again, the book of Hebrews is helpful. Hebrews 12, 2 calls us to run the race looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him, and there was in heaven, back in the presence of his father, but it goes on to say, endured the cross. You know what it is to endure, to put up with, to keep going under pressure, endured the cross, despising the shame. He took no pleasure in those punishments, he took no pleasure in that separation from his father, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This little verse is a, a, a powerful testimony that though his human nature cries out for another way, and that's us, isn't it? His heart is set on following his father. Father, if it's your will, Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You don't see in the Greek that there are two different words for will. In the English, that there are two different words for will. The first one refers to God's eternal purpose. Father, if it is your will, if you, if you, if you know of another way to, to bring about the redemption of the people of God from sin and judgment and to open the door to heaven to them, if there is just possibly another way, notice the Father included there. In Mark's Gospel, the word Abba is included. And you know from the little bit of preaching you've heard that Abba is Daddy. He's pleading. He's at his human wit's end, if I can use that language. I'm in real difficulty because I, I know he's the son of God, but I also know he's the perfect man. Father, Daddy, if there's another way, take this cup from me. The term cup is used throughout the Old Testament as, 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 as a life, as a, a, a program, as, and, and is directly related to God's wrath. And for Jesus, he would be looking at it as God's wrath. He's, he's struggling in his humanity, but here comes through the power of obedience. Nevertheless, not my will. Now the word will here is not what I want. Not what I wish could happen. But yours be done. And so the Lord of glory cries out for deliverance. 
but embraces our sin and God's judgment because that's why he came into the world Mark 10 45 even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve to serve his heavenly father and how would he serve him by giving his life as a ransom for many when Peter is preaching Acts chapter 3 verse 18 those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets that Christ would suffer he has thus fulfilled you see he knew the prophets and that they had explained this but at this minute he probably has a preview of the agonies that are going to be his in crucifixion he probably understands that he will be forsaken by his father and so he cries out pleading for deliverance but he is God's servant he is God's servant one of my books had it put it this way Jesus wants out fear is not sin he faced fear with faith Jesus I never really thought about it like that you see Jesus wants out the man but rather than come out he's serving God he is God's servant his desire is surrendered to his father the way forward is trusting in his father he will indeed take the cup because his primary goal in life is to do what the father had appointed him to do what the prophet had revealed would be the nature of the servant Isaiah 42 behold my servant whom I uphold that's an interesting thought isn't it prophesied 800 years before Christ behold my servant whom I uphold how does he uphold because the servant relies on him my elect one in whom my soul delights that's Jesus I have put my spirit upon him and he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Matthew includes that in Matthew 12 verse 18. And more of that same passage from Isaiah 42. Jesus had embraced this role. He knew that's why he had come into the world. He knew that by serving his father in perfect obedience, he would also serve those that the father had given to him. To deliver us from our disobedience. To deliver us from judgment and to bring us to glory he had the end of Isaiah 53 to lean on he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied by his knowledge my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities notice that language my righteous servant but before that it says by his knowledge because he knows why he's here because he knows what will happen if he will simply obey the father and finish the course but he still had to make that choice R.C. Sproul writes our Lord knew all along that he was destined for a horrible death a death under the wrath of God now the hour had come he was willing to do whatever the Father required he was willing to do whatever Father but he had to he had to work it through he had to come to that point where he had to grasp it and embrace it as his own and so he stands where Adam and Eve fell for them it was just a piece of fruit don't eat it it seems almost impossible that they couldn't resist that just a piece of fruit don't eat it for in the day that you eat thereof you shall surely die for Jesus it's the whole weight of human sin and iniquity it's the glory of his father in heaven who is righteous and would display his righteousness in showing that sin can't be swept under the carpet it has to be paid for the account has to be cleared who's going to do it well, the good news is that he did indeed completely do it. And because he did it, our world has been transformed. 
There are Christians all over the world today worshipping this Savior because he, he went through this struggle and he entered into the Father's presence through the cross for our glory. So that now, dear friend, no matter how difficult our lives might become, they will never be the judgment of God upon us for our sin because our sins are forgiven. There is now, therefore, no condemnation because we're in Christ Jesus. He is our substitute. He's established the way of life, the way back to God from the dark paths of sin. I read this little account. It said a man was drafted as a soldier, but he did not have to go to battle because a friend stepped in and was accepted but as his substitute. The substitute then served in the war till he was killed in battle. The man for whom he was substituted was drafted a second time but refused to serve. On appearing before a judge, he pleaded that he had been drafted once, had served in the war by means of his substitute, and should now be considered as being dead because his substitute had been killed. That's what Jesus did for you and me. That's our argument in glory. Daft as it might appear. Strange. It's not strange, really. It's the effect of God's love, his mercy. Because God's wrath is a terrible thing to contemplate. And surely as believers every day when we realize we're not being crushed and, and cast into eternal hell, then, then the, the spring of joy should break forth again. But for those who are not believers, I need to impress upon you that, that if you've not got Jesus paying your penalty, you will have to drink that cup for yourself. And the strange, strange thing is, it's not terrifying you as it did him. Millions today just drift on carelessly through life as if it didn't matter. Hell is a reality, an awful reality. It's a place where those who won't have Christ will feel the wrath and eternal punishment of God. But you don't need to take it. Just simply flee to Christ. Plead with God and embrace him as your substitute. And wow, what a privilege to be a Christian. Finally, he's a man of prayer. He's God's servant, but he's also under attack. As I read this, you see, you come to verse 43. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Only Luke includes these two verses. And I believe they indicate to us that there was a spiritual battle going on that day. Not just this external human battle. There was a real spiritual battle. Our Lord is wrestling with more than flesh and blood. And for that reason, the Father sends an angel to comfort him. I'll show you my argument as I take it further through. Because what Jesus did in life and on Calvary was also observed and watched and attacked regularly by Satan himself. He had a vested interest in Jesus not going to the cross. And there can be no doubt that some of the oppression that the Savior felt would be the oppression from this spiritual battle. Continually throughout his life, Jesus has talked about Satan's presence. I will no longer talk much with you, John 14, 30. For the ruler of this world is coming. And he has nothing in me. We knew he was coming. He knew that he would have to wrestle with him. He had seen what Satan did to, to, to Judas. Verse 3 of chapter 22. Judas, sorry, then Satan entered Judas. And off he went to do his terrible work. He had prayed for Simon. Remember, it's in verse 31 of this chapter. Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you. He had to be conscious of Satan being there. He had to be conscious. Kistemacher writes, it's not, sorry, is it not reasonable to assume that during these dreadful periods of anguish, Satan and his demons assaulted him with the intention of causing him to turn aside from the path of obedience? 
Does that ring any bells about the garden? Has God really said? That's the work of the enemy, isn't it? Boring into our consciousness with, with doubts and fears and questions, when in actual fact we should be saying, your will be done, not mine, to the Father. Satan had met him in the wilderness at his weakest point, 40 days and nights of fasting, and he tempts him three times. At the end of that, it says in Matthew 4, 9 through 11, that Satan offered Jesus the whole world, all these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Does it ring any bells with that passage, you see? The devil left him, angels came and ministered to him. R.C. Sproul is really quite helpful. He says, in answering Jesus' prayer, the Father sent an angel as if to say, I'm sorry, son, but you must drink this cup. However, here is an angel to give you strength for the task. Here is an angel. Here is God's minister come to the <coughs> Lord of glory to support him through this traumatic time. Hebrews 2.9, we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honour. He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. And so the Lord of glory is indeed upheld by this angel, strengthened by him. And surely the promise of God is that he will strengthen us He will equip us by his spirit and by his word as we face this course of life that we're called to follow on. And our road is far easier than the Savior's. And then you have this little cameo, don't you, of the great drops of blood falling down. It's clearly a simile. Then his sweat became like Remember, like it's comparison. It's not saying it actually became. But it was as if his forehead was bleeding. You only do that when you're under intense pressure. That only happens when your human body is in fact at its weakest point and most likely to be crushed. There is in fact a medical condition which might also help explain it to us, see if I can pronounce the word, it's not my strongest point. Hema, hematidrysis. See, I've told you I'm getting wrong. You can look at my notes after and get the, the, the Latin word. But apparently it's well recognized in history that when you're under such great and intense pressure, the capillaries in your forehead can burst. And therefore it colors your sweat. And that would seem to fit in with this as well, you see. These, these lines help us to understand what it meant for the Saviour who knew no sin to become sin for us. They help us to understand the amazing work of God so that, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. He's under attack. He survived the attack. And because he survived that attack, so will you and I. Colossians 2.15 Having disarmed the principalities and powers. We know who he's talking about, don't we? Having disarmed principalities and powers. He won the fight. He made a public spectacle of them. Triumphing over them in it. And if you go and read the context, verse 14 tells you that it is the cross. He fought the battle, he, he conquered Satan, and he has chained him. Because of his obedience, he brings about salvation for you and I. Satan still blusters, doesn't he? He still huffs and puffs, but he can't blow the house down. He goes about like a roaring lion, and you will feel his breath. 
humble yourself under God's mighty hand confessing your sin and claiming Christ as your saviour it truly will bring you through we need to recognise how important prayer is for the battle and that before Jesus went to that cross he was a praying man an obedient man he knew he was in the spiritual warfare Paul tells us the weapons of our warfare are not carnal but mighty under God to the bringing down of strongholds what are our weapons? prayer we accomplish nothing without it and anything we accomplish without it is not actually a success prayer is not for procurement but for protection said one of my books in other words prayer is not simply to ask for things you need or want but it is also to protect you from things you don't need or want stop praying and be tempted unnecessarily stop praying and your kids will be vulnerable to attacks of the enemy stop praying and your marriage will be attacked constantly Jesus said one of the keys to protection from temptation or trouble is prayer It's right up there in verse 40. It's my text for next week. It's how we overcome because Christ overcame. And if you're not a Christian, you say, it reminds me that unbelievers are just Satan's muppets, Satan's puppets. He makes them jump, dance, and sing to his own tune. And he's happy to keep them amused with a few things and trinkets of time because he knows when the curtain falls he's going to have company in eternal hell. There's a short video scooting around the internet. I looked at it just this, you know, yesterday it was in fact trying to remember the man's name, you all know him he's a famous actor, he's a comedian he, he Stephen mm. and he was interviewed and he, 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 he was asked if there was a God and he was to meet him, what would he say and he immediately begins a rant about how horrible God is and if there is a God he doesn't want to go into his heaven look and I think how many poor foolish people will listen to him and say neither do I they take these individuals who have prominent places and they use them to bend the minds of people Satan is active today how are you ever going to overcome and, and be successful by trusting the saviour and by them to pray be on your knees continually I read the text this morning it was in another context pray without ceasing rejoice always in everything give thanks pray without ceasing that means not just in your quiet times as you have opportunity as you're walking, driving, talking wherever you are realize you need God Christ has died for you and your prayers will be answered Amen